as we start uh, today's evening talk, uh, which is the need for unity and love in the 21st century. And we are very honored to have Brother Muhammad bin Yahya Aninawit. He's a very renowned scholar across uh, UK, and he's been uh, here from originally from Canada. So again, okay. from US. From US. Uh, okay, for us it's, it's the same. But Alhamdulillah, we are very honored to have him. And uh, we'll start with the Quranic recitation and then uh, we'll uh, listen from his wisdom, inshallah. Oh. 
خالدون تلك آيات الله نتلوها عليك بالحق وما الله يريد ظلما للعالمين ولله ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وإلى الله ترجع الأمور صدق الله العظيم Why do you disbelieve in the verses of God while God is witness over what you do? Saying, O people of the scripture, why do you avert from the way of God those who believe, seeking to make it seem deviant while you are witnesses to the truth? And God is not unaware of what you do. O you who have believed, if you obey a party of those who were given the scripture, they will turn you back after your belief to being unbelievers. And how could you disbelieve while to you are being recited the verses of God, and among you is his messenger? And whoever holds firmly to God has indeed been guided to a straight path. O oh, you who have believed, fear God as he should be feared, and do not die except as Muslims in submission to him. And hold firmly to the rope of Allah altogether, and do not become divided. And remember the favour of God upon you when you were enemies and he brought your hearts together and you became by his favour brothers. And you were on the edge of a pit of the fire and he saved you from it. Thus does God make clear to you his verses that you may be guided. And let there be arising from you a nation inviting to all that is good, enjoining what is right and forbidding what is wrong. And those will be the successful. And do not be like the, the ones who became divided and differed after the clear proofs had come to them. And those will have a great punishment. On the day, some faces will turn white and some faces will turn black. As for those whose faces turn black, to them it will be said, did you disbelieve, i.e. reject faith, after your belief? Then taste the punishment of what you used to reject. But as for those whose faces turn white, they will be within the mercy of God. They will abide therein eternally. These are the verses of God. We recite them to you in truth. And God wants no injustice to the worlds. To God belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth. And to God will all matters be returned. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأكمل التسليم على سيدنا محمد سيد الأولين والآخرين وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين ورضي الله عن أصحابه أجمعين وعنا معهم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين أما بعد فالسلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته well, it's nice to be amongst you today. I was trying to look for the uh, for the topic, but um, and please excuse our delay. Traffic, I guess, in London is unexpected. There is a slight difference between Canada and the U.S. For those of you <laughs> who have been there, obviously, among the most important things is Canada is really cold, and in the southern U.S. where I come from, it's warm. So it's nice. And now, with the uh, world uh, temperature and environment going a bit crazy, I guess that everything is the same everywhere. Let's start with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we'll go from there. يَقُولُ اللَّهُ جَلَّ وَعَلَى بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد جاءكم رسول من أنفسكم عزيز عليه ما عنتم حريص 
Harisun alaikum bil mu'minina raufun rahim. There we go. The need for unity and love in the 21st century. All right. The need for unity and love ever. 21st and the first and forever and ever. The verse that I just recited may mean, if translated, to you has come a messenger from amongst you. لَقَدِ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِّنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ to you, Jaakum, Rasulun, a messenger come, came from you. From you, to you, to you, from you. The verse here tries to put some or infuse some pride in the ummah. people that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to, to tell them in, in a way that, look, you are so fine and you are great, despite what you have, I mean, everyone, obviously humanity, human beings aspire to perfection. I believe, obviously, that the school of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi starting from Adam, Nuh, Noah, Musa, Moses, Isa, Jesus, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, they all came to give that schooling to perfect the human being. The human being is created perfect, but the human being needs to aspire to perfection. The Creator subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah jalla jalaluhu, put, gave us as human beings the capacity to perfect ourselves and to rise. Allah says it clearly in the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa nafsin wa ma sawaha. The atwal qasam in the Quran. This is the longest oath, this is the longest qasam in the Quran. Allah says, right, from the beginning, uh, until the ayah goes, wa nafsin wa ma sawaha, fa alhamaha fujura wa taqwaha. The nafs, the soul, the self, he created, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the creator of your soul. If you seek purification of the heart, of that soul, then Allah says, Then you have succeeded. And then on the other verse goes to say, وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا And those who don't seek purification of the heart indeed will lose. So there's a clear road. Obviously the Prophet as schools, Rabbani schools, yani schools that, were, that came for the happiness of humanity, schools that came the Prophet all of them, and our Prophet being the last and the final one of them, of them, came to give every single human being, irrespective of background, hope, hope, growth, and opportunity. Home. Home. Home for the soul. And that's why you'll see them, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, don't kill, don't, 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 right? There's all these, I'm not talking about just the don'ts. But the things that we all share in common. Every single human being wants to have hope. And every single human being looks for growth and opportunity. And Nabi Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as a school that is teaching people, Look at the situation before the Betha or and after the after, before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came and after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came. The Arabian Peninsula was locked in wars and violence. So you all know something that's not something I'm telling you. People used to fight forty years over one line of poetry that one tribe said about the other tribe. Bloodshed.
a message comes and tells them, all right, you, there's rights. Love yourself. Yourself, you've got right. Love yourself. Love yourself. So you can live happy. If you love yourself, you can love, you can afford to love others. Love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Love the creator for what he gives you. Gives you. Love the creator subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you see, Al-Sunnah al Nabawi al Sharif, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wants to teach us more a practical lesson in love. Not simply just talk. And therefore, Al Quran Karim makes a note, note, a notation to this for us to say, Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim, Qadija akum min Allahi nurun wa kitabun mubin. You have received from Allah nur and kitab mubin. Most of the Mufassirin go to say, Al Kitab is when nur is a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that sheds light. In other words, the book tells you what to do. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam manifests to you how you're doing it. Action and words together. So, before he came, a tribal habit used to, ha used to happen. You all are probably aware of it. They viewed women as non-productive members of society. The tribal, the tribes back for 1,500 some years ago. Well, obviously, because the way of making and earning back then, 1,500 years ago, was through wars. And that means a, a bigger tribe invades a smaller tribe, ransacks what they have, and enslave their, uh, their men, and take their women as concubine and kill the fighters. That's how it used to happen. And you all know the poetry in the old days, uh, it was about the pride of being on top of the horse all the time. There's, there was in the desert. There was no farming to do much, and the the tribes at some time viewed that if you eat from what you're working, this is not for you. This is for the workers. This is what slaves do. They eat from what they work. Bah, can you eat from what you fight? The sword and the horse. Obviously, women at that time, they viewed her as a non-productive member of society because it was not allowed for her to fight. So she sits at home in the tent or whatever that is. And since she's not a non-productive member, as they viewed her, of society, then she is a burden on society. Hence, she doesn't deserve to live, really. So they used to bury them, right? You all know the stories. They used to, someone, if, if someone's got a couple of females, they'll just bury her alive right when she's born. There's no picture that's more cruel than that. Now, Islam comes when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam comes to teach us, as in the Hassan narration, that Nisa, Shaqa'iq al-Rijal, that female, that women are equal to men, that this and that, no? La yukrimuhunna, the other narrations, la yukrimuhunna illa kareem, only an honorable person honors them, and only this honorable person dishonors them. All these other hadith and all these narrations, but that's not enough. You take him, Nabi Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, takes you to a practical, let me take you to a practical scene, and you all know it. He's sitting down in a majlis, and the hadith is authentic, Tabarani and others narrated it, and Hassan to say the least, and his daughter, a Sayyidah Fatima to Zahra, السلام, comes in and he stands up for her they used to bury their daughters before now they see in front of them that the Mustafa وسلم, is standing up for his daughter out of respect and love and not only that, وَقَبَّلَهَا And then he used to kiss her, صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم. And then he, have, he asked her to sit in his own seat, where he was sitting, out of honoring her. This is a practical transition from, it's a drastic transition from when they used to dishonor them or what do you, 
to someone where the now the messenger, the Prophet وسلم, Sayyidul Anbiya wal Mursaleen himself is standing up to her and kissing her and have her sit in his seat. There's a tr transition, there's a change of, of ways, not only in the way you say things, but in the way you do things. <coughs> the message was more a practical approach Because love as a word and the need for love, love as a word became sometimes cheap. I love you, you love me, I love this. Every time, every time, sometimes, whenever we see something, oh, I love this, I love that. And the use of the word love sometimes is not really representative of what the word is. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam warned us to take a practical lesson of love from some of the aspects of the seerah and the sunnah. Look at this hadith and you all can deduce from it. Hadith Rawal Bukhari, obviously, the Sahih and Abi Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala. Hadith that, the hadith of about the no one wama man adha li waliyan faqad آذنته بالحمل عادلي وليا فقد آذنته بالحرب وما يزال عبد وما تقرب إلي عبدي بشيء أحب إلي مما اقترضته عليه my servant the hadith is قدسي where Allah سبحانه وتعالى tells us that my servant my creation عبدي would not does not or would not do anything to get close to me more than more beloved to me than what I asked him or her to do. Faraid. Yani, the hadith that Rawa Aylan and Bukhari Muslim, both of them actually, an Arabi, a Bedouin, came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Told him, Ya Rasulullah, Dullani ala amalan idha amiltuhu dakhaltu jalad. Give me, tell me something. If I do, just tell me one thing. I, you know, this thing is, just tell me one thing. If I do, I'll be granted heavens. <laughs> You worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without associating, without worshiping any other god or any other deity with him. That the fard salah that you do, fard, was siyam, and to add the zakat, what the summa Allah he told him, the last one. If you do this, then the basics, then you are eligible for, for Jannah. But look at the Hadith al-Bukhari that Abu Huayra narrated the other one, the Hadith al-Qudsi. So my servant does not do anything that is more beloved to me than what I asked him to do. This one, do it and that's it, you're done. But wait. وَمَا يَزَالُ عَبْدِي يَتَقَرَّبُ إِلَيَّ بِالنَّوَافِلِ And then Allah tells us, which means, my servant then will do extra worship, extra things, until hatta uhibba, until I love him. If you want to get Jannah, do your fara'id. But for those who want to attain the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they do things extra, more than just the fara'id. What this hadith, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, what this hadith is trying to tell us is this. If you really love, you give. Loving means giving. Giving without expectation of any tangible return. Innama nuta'imukum the ayah goes to say, right? We give you, when they were asked, when they gave food for the needy and all this, why are you giving food for recognition? So you recognize, so you're doing this? No, 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 no. We feed, we're giving you, نطعمكم, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لا نريد منكم جزاء ولا شكورا. We expect no reward, nor even thanks or recognition from you. We're doing this just for his sake, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which is telling us that if you want to attain love, you have to give. 
Love is not just about saying things. And that's the difference, the difference between narcissistic approach to love, self-infatuation, and true love. Everyone needs love. Love is a need. And I appreciate that they put the need for unity and love. Human beings need love. In fact, not only did the Quran and Sunnah sort of put that as part of our, an integral part of our faith, the need for love, but even sociologists, right? Abraham Maslow, the American sociologist that passed away in the 1970s from the Brooklyn Institute, many of you probably know, put in his pyramid about the needs of human beings, acceptance and love. Everyone needs to be, needs to feel that they're accepted, that they're loved. That's normal. But what kind of love? That first kind of narcissistic love. You do things so there's mutual relations with people and they say they love each other and they, people may love you because you're funny or they may love you because you're this and that. That's all fine and dandy. Like the Quran Karim wants us to do something slightly different. The Sunnah Nabawiyah wants, wants us to do something slightly different. That we don't base our love simply on a kind or a quality of a relationship vis-a-vis -vis the creation only. But our love is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to the Creator first, and from that all kinds of love stem. Because your love to the Creator subhanahu wa ta'ala ought to be then consistent. And from that comes the love and the positive contribution to everything. Not only to humanity, but everything. Why? Well, because Allah, if you love Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells you, as He said in the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَفْعَلُوا الْخَيْرَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ Do good so that you may attain success. That's what the Quran tells us. If you truly love Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, you truly love Him, that love will transform you. It will not be information. It will be transformation. So that you're transformed into a giving, a positive contribu contribution, a positive contributor, not only to yourself. Because وَفْعَلُ الْخَيْرِ مُطْلَقَ وَفْعَلُ الْخَيْرِ is open, is unlimited. He sends his reign, subhanahu wa ta'ala, unto those he loves, unto those who worship him, and unto those who don't worship him, isn't it? He sends his reign unto everyone. Those who recognize that he is their creator and those who don't recognize that he is their creator. That's the point of the compassionate term here or the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ar-Rahim. Or ar-Rahman. But then when you love him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, you combine from those meanings something that turns you and transforms you into a positive, loving and a positive contrib contributor to everything. Not that you care only about the well-being, narcissistically, only the well-being of your own self and the self-infatuation and that the world is only me and me, me, myself and I. But you actually genuinely care about the well-being of your family and your community and your society and your country that you're part of and live in. And not only that, the world, but not only the world, the universe as is. With all its contents, you are transformed into a loving and a positive contributor, a positive contribution force and energy. But that's because your love is genuine to the Creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wal hadith li rawa. Al Bukhari wa also Muslim with slight addition in Muslim. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam tells us that Ida ahabba Allahu al abd. If Allah loves someone. Now notice, the first hadith is if you do the basics, just do your basics, and sort of, you get into, you get. Heavens for what you're doing, huh? Then you do extra. Extra for what? Because love means you're doing more. Love means you're doing more. You go the extra mile. That's what love is. Love is not talk, it's doing more. It's not talking the talk, it's walking the walk. We talk about love, 
but how many actually do things about love? How many people actually are willing to go out of their ways for the sake of his love, subhanahu wa ta'ala? Well, you say, Maid, wait a minute, it's, they're not people that I, I'm doing good to, they're not, they're not good enough, they, they don't, they're not, these people are bad, and the others hate me, and the others don't like my faith, and they, these people, they really defame Islam, and it's not about them, it's not about what they do, it's about what you do, it's about you, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Your love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make you do what? <coughs> will make you do what they do if you think that's what they're doing. You're focusing on a totally wrong, wrong thing. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to be with Him. And do as He pleases, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not become a set of reactions to things. You, you keep doing extra things for His sake. La jaza'an wa la shukura. You're not expecting anything in return. Nothing. Why do you do this? It's because I love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Makes you do things. Ida ahabba Allah al then the result obviously, as Al Bukhari Muslim tells us in their Suhir. If Allah loves someone, Nada Jibril, in Allah Yuhibbu Fila Fulan and Fahbib. Allah loves so and so. So Ya Jibreel love him. Fayuhibbu Jibreel. Jibreel loves him. And then Jibreel doesn't stop here. He calls into the people of heavens. He says, In Allah Yuhibbu Fulan and Fahibbu. Allah loves so and so, so love him. Fayuhibbu Ahlu Sama. So the people of heavens love that person. Wa yuba'u lahu al kabulu fil arm. And then on earth, you'll see good people recognize them. They love them. They accept them. Look. No one is saying that life is a walk in the park all the time in its reality. Life is life. Life has challenges. Life has ups and downs. Life is not always rosy the way we'd like it to be. In life, we as the human social fabric of this life, we have the good, the bad, and the ugly. In every place, in every nation, in everyone. We ourselves fluctuate between doing good and bad, and sometimes ugly. There's a need for us to realize that love is a need for us. You, if you live your life without love, it's a waste. Well, waste. You know what? Number one, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made that obligatory in a sense. You have to love him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hadith Rawal Bukhari, Sahih, and others, you all know it. Hadith Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa al Farooq. Huh? You all know the hadith. And now, Ya Umar, and now, Ya Umar, right? With the Iman of Umar, and you know, you all know who Umar is. There's no need for me to talk to you about Sayyidina Umar. So despite the great Iman of Umar, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would tell him that your Iman is complete until you love me more than you love yourself, Ya Umar. Love. And the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam makes it part of Iman. Your Iman is, in, your faith is incomplete until you have love. And it's not easy. Shuf Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu Allah ta'ala sadiq ma'ana shi Sayyidina al-Faruq wa bi-hudlahu wa ba'i and yani he's truthful. Because now if we say, who loves Allah? Who loves Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Who loves to do good? Everyone will say, I do, I do, I do. What are you doing about it? It's not about what you say. It's about what you do. How are you trans... You're saying you love Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before that, obviously. You love the sahaba, radiallahu anhu majma'een. You love, you love. What is that making you do that love? What is it transforming you to do? Is it information? Or is it still... Is it information? Or is it transformation? Is it just talk? Because you all know, and I say that all the time, you know, nowadays, oftentimes, when Islam is portrayed in a, in a way that's not necessarily accurate, we, we rush away and tell people who are not Muslims, hey, brother, don't you read? No, no, I'm just, I'm just making time. Love this year. 
Hey, don't you read the Quran? Now, have you ever read the Quran, brother? What's going on? You don't know what the Quran is? You're talking about Islam like this way? Here, let me give you uh, the Quran. Read. Bismillah. People don't want to read. People want to see Islam in action. People want to, don't, want to, don't want you to tell them that Islam is a faith, a religion of compassion and love and mercy. They want to see compassion and mercy and love in you, in what you do, not in your words, in your action. They want to see that transformed human being that is now flowing energy of love and a flowing energy of passion and a flowing energy of care, genuine care about them and everyone else and about everything Allah created. It's not just saying, yeah, it's a religion of mercy, brother. Come on. Hey, man, you know, you don't know that? You don't read? Well, you know, I want to see what did that do to you. How did that transform you? Actions speak louder than words, right? The Chinese have a good thing. They say, a picture is worth a thousand words. A picture is worth a thousand words. I'm not saying don't tell people that you love them. Please do. But actions speak louder than words. There has to be apa. There has to be giving. You have to actually. My my worshiper will keep doing extra, doing, doing. Not saying, huh? He told us. He says, like he says, do tazkiya. Get close to Allah, but don't claim it. لا تزكوا أنفسكم هو أعلم بمن اتقى. He knows who is really pious. He knows who is really loving. Don't call yourself people of love and people of purification and this. No, no. Just do, do the talk. Walk the walk. Leave the talk. لا تزكوا أنفسكم لكن قد أفلح من تزكى. Both two ayahs. Because it's easy to fall in that narcissistic approach or that self-righteous box of ours. <coughs> I'm right, everyone else is wrong. It's only me. It's about me, myself and I. That's not love. That's love of yourself. Love, as Islam tells us and puts it, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Bukhari says, uh, there's another addition to this. Until he loves me more than he loves his father and sons or children and nasi ajma'in. That love is not logical only. Why is he bringing us this example? Why is he comparing his love with the love of your father and your children? How do you love your children, those of you who have children? Do you love them intellectually through a logical process, saying to yourself, um, that's my DNA, I love them. <laughs> right? I mean, it's, after all, that's my daughter, that's my son, so I've got to love them. <coughs> that's not how you love your children, is that? It's not how you love your mother and father. You love them passionately. There's not a logical process only, that's one thing. But there's an emotional process. There's an outpouring, passionate love. When Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam puts his comparison, puts that comparison to tell you that love is not simply a, a logical process that you just process through and you say, all right, I succumb to the idea that I have to love uh, the Creator. I have to love the messengers. No, no, no. You have to be involved with your emotions also with him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that also is with each, with each other. He tells us, and you all know, the hadith is sahih. We all know more hadith than I do in, in, the, in all these things. La yu'minu ahadukum. One of you is not a complete believer until he loves for his fellow brother what he loves for himself. Right? We all know the hadith. It's not only logical belief in the hadith. How many practice the hadith? How many of us actually Love for their fellow human being. What they, for their, for their, what they love for themselves. Love. Not only want. And how many of us don't want anyone to know, to have what we have. And because thinking that 
we got it. Not only Allah, not Allah gave it to us. Not Allah gave you the blessing and the guidance and, and the rizq. Love is giving. Love is a positive contribution. Love is caring. When Islam came to tell us to love and care, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, the, first, the very first verse we read in the book, not only in one of the first ayah, and every single ayah except Tawbah, right? And Tawbah is in there somewhere in the middle. Hmm? In the name of Allah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, the most compassionate, the most compassionate. Both of them mean the same. They both have al ishtiqaq al wahid Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim have the same stem linguistically. It comes from compassion, Rahim. In the name of Allah, the most compassionate, the most compassionate. Why is he saying that so, twice? And both of them are siyah mubalagha. Linguistically speaking, both of them are form of, forms of exaggerative speech. Yani Ar-Rahman, the one who's attributed with unquant an unquantifiable compassion, excessive, extremely compassionate. And Ar-Rahim also means extremely compassionate. Why is he putting it right next to each other? And why then he made it for us, we're reading it every time we read every ayah. Why do we read it every time we read the Fatiha, every time in our Salah, every time in our prayers, five time prayers, every time we read it, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Why? Isn't that a... A reminder, Ya Habibi, to get some, get some compassion in you. There's a message coming to you. Take in some compassion. No, don't talk about compassion. Practice compassion. I always aspire for workshops on compassion. Huh? Not just lectures. This is theory. We're, 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 we became masters. Uh, theories, we MashaAllah, we're all masters. Now we need, we need work. We need, we need actually to do things on, on the ground. يقول صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم هو صحيح في صحيح مسلم المسلم أخو المسلم لا يحقره لا يظلمه لا يخذله. Right? The Muslim is the fellow brother. The Muslim does not do harm to him. Does not do ظلم to him. Does not do does not belittle him. How come then when we disagree with each other, all of a sudden all these values and principles are erased and put on hold? Iman. Al Hadith and Nabawi, Ya Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he says something, it's not for us to logically believe in only, it's to practice. It's to put into practice. It's not to say, oh sure he said that. Well, what, what are you doing about it? Oh well, but he doesn't agree with me. Guess what? Unity does not mean conformity. If the Sahaba had taught us anything, I always say, they taught us that we can look at the same thing and see it in two different ways. Everyone sees one aspect of this, but you're both looking at the same thing. I see one aspect, you see another aspect. There's always going to be differences in opinion because people Capacitate things differently. Their intellectual capacitation of the text is different. Al Madarik is different. Their knowledge is different. Their perception is different. That should not wipe up and erase the love and compassion we ought to have to each other. And not only between each other, but the genuine compassion that we ought to practice, not to talk about. <laughs> with every other human being, irrespective of background and creed and, and everything, and ethnicity and, and all that stuff. I mean, isn't that actually what Islam came in the beginning to teach people? Did the Prophet ﷺ come to this world armed with weapons of mass destruction? Or did he come armed with weapons of mass construction and instruction? Did he come with the logic of power or the power of logic? Did he come with information or with transformation? Why then do we sometimes fall into this pit hole or, or, or this ditch, in a sense, if we were to say, 
rendering our faith into a ritual rather than spiritual. Yeah, a salah has a spiritual component. Well, your fasting has a spiritual component. And your mu'amalat, even the word, one word that you say, has a spiritual component with it. وَقُولُوا قَوْلًا سَدِيدًا The Qur'an goes to say, يُصْلَحْ لَكُمْ أَعْمَالَكُمْ If you say righteous things, well, wait a minute. The power of the word, one word, yeah, one word. The word that you say, it's your word as long as it's still in your heart. Yeah, Habibi. But once you, once you utter that word, it's no longer yours. It's either for you or against you. It's either a good word or a bad word. When Nabi Adam sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam wa sallam teaches us something nice, you all know the hadith of Sahih. Man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawm al-akhir fal yuqul khara awli yasmat. Yani if you've got something, if you believe in Allah on the day of judgment, if you've got something good to say, say it. You don't have anything good to say? Don't say anything. Practice silence. It's nice for a change. Because we talk all the time. Even when we're not talking with our tongues, we're talking with our hearts and minds. Right? The microprocessors are going 24 hours. Even when you're sleeping, you put your head on that pillow, and you're sleeping out of exhaustion because your microprocessors are just going. And then you just give you know, your energy, you're just exhausted, so you just... So that lack of mental clarity is there too. The point of Ibadah is also that we have some mental clarity. We have some tranquility. We have some time with the Creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala, one-on-one. When you talk to Him, okay, wake up at the end of that night, or at night, do some two rakah of salah, and talk to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Speak to Him. Do that munajah with Him. Ya Rabbi. Tell Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you love Him. And not only tell him that you love him, await for transformation also from that love that you're doing, from that devotion that you're having. Because love is not just a word. It's not a feeling that you have. It's a transformation. It's a state that you live. With, not, with your conscious and your mind and your heart and your limbs, it transforms you. That's what love is. It's not just a feeling or just a word. Some people render that, reduce that to a word. I love you. Do you really love me? You know, you've heard that before, I'm sure. All right. When we talk about love, if we have that cemented down, in other words, our relationship with the Creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala, we worship Him as if we're seeing Him. We love Him. And you actually not talk about this, but you actually live it. You live it. Not only feel it, but you live it. Live it. How you say that Aisha Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anha wa arlaha, Ummu al-Mu'mineen, your mother. You know the hadith, hadith sahih, for sahih. She sees him, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, standing up at night until his feet are swam, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi Praying until his feet are swam. وَهُوَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ سَيِّدُ الْخَلَائِقِ سَيِّدُ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ وَالْمُرْسَلِينَ The master of the messenger. I mean, you know, you name it. صاحب المقام الأعلى وقاب قوسين يا ودنا And he's standing up the whole night until his feet are swollen. She tells him, يا رسول الله ولفظ الحديث مروي عن المغيرة وعن عائشة رضي الله عنها ولفظ عائشة has even an addition رضي الله عنها She tells him, why are you doing this? وَقَدْ غَفَرَ اللَّهُ لَكَ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِكَ وَمَا تَأَخَّرَ يقول يا عائشة أفلا أحب ولفظ المغيرة أفلا أكون أفلا أحب أن أكون عبدا شكورا Shouldn't I love to be a thankful worshiper of him? Love to be a thankful worshiper That love to be with Allah سبحانه وتعالى The love not just simply because I'm, what am I going to get in return? Because that's our relationship with each other, unfortunately, nowadays lately. Oh, so I'm, I'm going to be your friend? Yeah, what, what am I going to get in return? Oh, he's really funny, so that's good. You know? Or, you know, like one of the people I know, he's always, he says, I, I like this guy. I said, why do you like him? He says, every time I, we meet, he takes and he buys me lunch. I said, do you love your stomach? You don't love him. Because, I mean, you know, every time you, so he buys you something, so you're, once he stops buying, once he stops buying you anything, he probably. <coughs> when our relationships are based 
amongst each other are based on the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we stop getting hurt by each other. And you all hear all these things, right? Oh, she was my friend for the past five years in college and I hate her now. Why? What did she do, do to you? She said, well, she said these things about me, blah, blah, blah. Right? You all, you all, you all heard that from our, from our sister's side and on the brother's side as well. You know, you know I don't like him anymore. Well, it's because we're basing our relationship on what's in it for me with you. So if you do me wrong one time, then I'm not, I'm not going to forgive you. But if that relationship that you have with that friend of yours is for the sake of Allah, I am becoming your friend because he, he subhanahu wa ta'ala, told me in the hadith that if I love you for his sake, then I will be granted a shade in the day of judgment. Right? Two people love each other for the sake of Allah, not for the sake of anything. And you all know the hadith of Sahih Muslim. That man, a man going to the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam present, a man going from one qarya to another village <coughs> to visit a akhalla. Fa'am sallallahu lahu rajateh. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala put one of the angels, looking like a human being, on the way of that man. So he stopped until that man is passing by. Salaamu Alaikum Where are you going? I'm going to that village. Why are you going to that village? Well, there is a brother of mine that I'm just going to visit. He says, uh, what, what kind of business is between you? I mean, what, what make, what's making you visit him? Is it anything, any business? He says, no, I have nothing. For the sake of Allah. Because I love him for the sake of Allah. That's what I have No business, no wheels, no deals. Hadith tells us, still in Sahih. He says, فَإِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكَ I am, then he told him, I am an angel, I am a messenger from Allah to you, telling you that Allah loves you because you love him that way for him. وَجَبَتْ مَحَبَّتِي الْحَدِيثِ صَحِيحِ فِيهِ وَالْمُتَزَاوِرِينَ فِيهِ وَالْمُتَجَالِسِينَ فِيهِ وَالْمُتَبَأْنِ All these things, that if you give for his sake, if you visit for his sake, if you befriend for his sake, because when you befriend <coughs> for his sake, and when you do things for his sake, subhanahu wa ta'ala, you don't anticipate recognition or return of people. Therefore, when people do not recognize you, or they do not see who you are, they do not appreciate you, you don't stop giving. Otherwise, you stop giving. Well, I'm not being recognized. But I'm, when you're doing this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you keep giving. Why? Because you're not really looking for the recognition. So if she does you wrong, well, you say, I'm, I became your friend for his sake. And, and so I'm willing to forgive you. But if you become her friend just for the sake of her, you know that you're not going to be forgiving her. And the same thing also for the guys. But if you are his, you are his friend or you are her friend for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you forgive. Look, I'm not, you know, I'm not stop, I'm not going to talk too long, but I'm not telling you that, that the Ummah situation is ideal. And I'm not telling you that we don't have differences. We absolutely do. But that all human beings have differences. But I am saying is this. Erect no walls of hate under the banners of love. Do not erect walls of hate under the banners of love or under any banner. The world today, if it needs anything, and our ummah specifically, if it needs anything, we need to infuse more love and compassion in our homes, in our hearts first, in our homes, in our communities, in our cities, in our country, whatever country that you are part of and you live in, and then in the whole world. We need to go back to spiritual rather than ritual. We have differences, sure. There's ways to agree to disagree. There are ways to agree to disagree. Civil ways. Without claiming righteousness over the truth. Exclusive rights of righteousness over the truth. 
without doing microsurgeries into the hearts of people and judge their intentions, like we sometimes do. Oh, they do this because they hate the sunnah. Okay. You don't know. Don't judge people's intentions. Don't judge people's intentions. People may do wrong, yes. We all do, at one time or another. Let's not judge people's intentions. Even those who make mistakes. Let's be good to those who are good to us and those who are not good to us. And I always say, if you're good to those who are good to you, then what good are you? What's the point? Islam did not teach you to be good to those who are good to you only. Islam taught you to be good to those who are good to you and those who are not good to you. Because if you're good to those who are good to you, what good are you? al jazaa li ihsani illa li ihsan matloob hada asasi Ya ahibba our deen is beautiful Wa al-nabi al-a'zam sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam is beautiful Our Lord is Rahman and Rahim most compassionate and our messenger is Ra'uf and Rahim as Allah named him most compassionate and our book, Al-Qur'an Al-Kareem, is a book of rahmah. is a book of compassion. Wallahi. No one lacks compassion except those among, in our ummah, except those who are far from Allah, His Prophet, and the Qur'an. No doubt about that. We can disagree. And we can have a, I don't like to call debates, but we can have round table discussions on how we disagree and how we carry out our disagreements under the etiquettes that Islam gave us under the banner of love and under the banner of that unity does not necessarily mean conformity even if we come to a dead end understanding we have creedal differences with other faith systems <coughs> that don't share anything almost with us except their humanity, but isn't, isn't that enough? Right? Hadith is Sahih Imam Muslim. You all know the hadith. It's an authentic narration. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stands up. A funeral comes by. He stands up. Sahaba are looking at him. Ya Rasulullah, this is not a Muslim. You're a Christian or a Jew or something like that in Medina at that time. He looks at them. He says, Awalaysat nafsa? Isn't it a soul? Isn't this a human being? Put you in touch with humanity by that time. Oh, the point is, uh, the point is not that uh, that 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 uh, you become only compassionate to those who you like and those who you agree with. In a sense, you become a source of compassion to al alamin The Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Allah sent him. With this mission statement, We have not sent you but a compassion to the universe, to the creation. Not compassion only to the people who believe in your message. You don't only contribute positively only to those who believe in you, but you are a positive contribution and you are a compassion, compassion, compassion. Not mercy, compassion, even bigger sort of more encompassing. Compassion alleviates or impels you to work hard to alleviate the suffering of everything around you. Everyone and everything. To work actively. What are we doing? What, what kind of active work are we doing to alleviate the suffering of human beings and animals and plants and Mother Earth that's suffering and suffocating and the universe and the, and the world that we live in? What are we doing about this? That's the question we ought to ask ourselves today. فَقَدْ الشَّيْءَ لَا يُعْتِي يَا رَحِبَّةً If you don't have something, if you don't love yourself, you can't love others. It's difficult. You can't give something you don't have. And we cannot give something we don't have. We can't preach something that we have not lived <coughs> and, and experienced. I, can, I always tell you, I can sit here and tell you what the ingredients of pizza is. Any of you like pizza? I stop after I wriggle. I realize it's full, filled with carbohydrates. You need to work out about three hours after that together. But anyway, still like pasta though. But anyway, I can sit here and tell you about pizza a hundred times. And I'll write it on the, on the smart board and I'll tell you 
ingredients are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, got it? And then you can't leave the room until you, right, you pass that test. What are the ingredients of pizza? So everyone gets out of here knowing what pizza is. And I'll put a couple of paragraphs what it tastes like. You need to taste pizza yourself. You'll have a different experience. Then you'll tell me what it tastes like. We can't just talk about compassion and love and unity if we don't do something about it within our hearts first. Change up hearts. Love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Realize that the message of life is much bigger than your own throne and your own world. Dethrone yourself from that arsh that you live on and sit on of your own world and try to put someone else on that throne and try to bring joy to their hearts. Try to bring comfort to their, to their selves, to themselves. Try to do that. So I think it's a call to action. When we talk about the need for unity and love, yes. Number one, yes. We need to be united as, hum as human beings. And as human beings, Islam offers every human being, irrespective of background, hope, growth, and opportunity. So let's be united around these values. We need to be united as, as human beings that Islam came at to be the source of compassion, to give life to people, not to take life away from people, right? To try to show an actual role model of happiness and tranquility and self and inner peace. Not to talk about inner peace only. But we gotta live these things. We can't just talk about them. You gotta live it, love it, and then we learn. The old the old examples they used to say that there's an old Sufi word, if you like to say, say Tazkiya if you don't like the word Sufi, whatever you like, doesn't make a difference. It's all Mustarahat. Says Lisan al Hal Afsahu min Lisan al Maqal. Lisan al Hal Afsahu min Lisan al Maqal. The tongue of your state is much more eloquent than the tongue of your mouth. There's a lot of work cut out for us. But unfortunately, we, we get ourselves bugged down in minute technicalities. And we leave the major themes in the Quran. Look at the major themes in the Quran. Open up the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And please, let's try to sort of stop reading the Quran. I shouldn't say stop. Let's not only read the Quran for tabarruk purposes only. Okay, so the Quran is a life book that's talking to you and me. Read it. The book was not sent for tabarruk only, for blessing purposes only. The book was sent for was revealed upon the Prophet وسلم, and then unto us so you can live it, love it, and live it. These eyes are dynamic. They're speaking to you. These atmos Live the atmospheres of revelation. The ajwa al nuzul the ajwa al Live in these ajwa. Live in these, in, the, in these atmospheres. They're not talking about people in the old days. Taraf, you don't know your history, you don't, you don't, you don't understand your present presence, and then you never get your you never get to plan your future right. Times may change, but people don't change. Faces and names change, but people are the same. People are people. Today we may have different <coughs> colors and different backgrounds and, and different ethnicities and Whatever different we are, but at the end of the day, we are one people, all of us. One people, one family. So the Islam tells us anyway. We're all the same. We're all the same. And we're all supposed to be working for the best of each other. We're all dependent on each other somehow. And then every one of us is dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> I shouldn't be talking longer than that, but we need to get to work. The Quranic themes, if you look at them, open the Quran, you see the Quran talks about zulm, injustice, so many times. Huh? Talks about tawheed, obviously, also in it. Talks about uh, adil, being fair. 
being good, ihsan, you see that all the time. Ta'amul, tafakkur, afala tafakkarun, don't they understand, don't they contemplate? Tries to put you in the picture of this universe. Well, ibadat are there also. Tells you, aqim salah, what is it? Ibadat are there. Part. But look at the major themes. Now we go to the technical aspect of the ibadat. Not only the ibadat itself, the technicalities of them. And I want to tell you that I am more righteous than you are. And I'm not saying there is no way, there are ways. And then we take that and we amplify it over everything. So now we become unjust and we do everything else for the sake of proving a minute technicality in the fiqh of ibadat. And then we learn a couple of sentences. We open up these booklets, 15-page booklets, and we learn. And then, now we want to disregard everybody and everyone. And the old way, the old, in the old times, they always say, those who know more object less. And knowledge makes you humble, because knowledge, the more you know, the more you realize how much you don't know. If you're filled, if you have knowledge, then you humble. Knowledge makes you humble. Knowledge makes you humble. Ignorance makes you arrogant. We need that knowledge in the deen, that if we claim that we know our deen, that knowledge ought to make you humble. Humble. A hum become a humble servant. And that's why Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prevented Mu'adh. Remember the hadith, Sahih al hadith has a hasan, also another hasan narration, which is more amplified version in a sense. Like, and he prevented them from standing. And he prevented them, what does he say? As well. When you say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan rasuluhu wa abdu, or what? What do you say first? Abduhu, then Rasuluhu. You don't say Rasuluhu wa abduhu, ma'anna huwa Rasuluhu sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa Like you say, Abduhu wa Rasuluhu. Afala akunu abdan. He tells us, I'm a servant. Huh? هون عليك حديث أصل صحيح إن معنا ابن امرأة من قريش كانت تأكل القديدة بمكة. All these things and تواضع المصطفى صلى الله عليه وعلى آله. That's not for that. He knows. أنا أعلمكم بالحديث الصحيح. He's the most knowledgeable of all of us in Allah. But that knowledge what that وخفض جناحك للمؤمنين. Knowledge makes us humble. And if we think we know, that's great. That ought to make us more humble and more passionate and more compassionate really with each other. The world and us first, yourself, your heart, awaits your positive contribution. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for me and you to put in our hearts love and compassion. That to look to this ummah and to the whole world, to the, all human beings, with an eye of compassion. How will I? To work more, more than just, to do, to walk more than just to talk. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tawfiq for me and you sallallahu wa trying to encourage Muslims to be um, loving, uh, and not just to Muslims, but to, to all humanity, and uh, to seek unity in that way. 
Um, <clears throat> I'm a Christian. And um, I'm very conscious that in the New Testament, the Injil, um, there are many commands for us to love. Love your neighbours yourself. Love your enemies. Do good to those who, who curse you. Um, pray for those who will treat you. Um, there, are, there are many exhortations to, to Christians in the Injil to love. And the nature of that love is self-sacrificial love. As you said, it's not just talking. It's something which costs. Absolutely. Um, now, that is the case with the, with the New Testament, with the NGO. But when I read the Quran last year, um, I, was, I was struck by the absence of love in the Quran. Um, we just, I, I didn't find the equivalent commands to love in the Quran. Rather, I found many um, exhortations to hatred and to, to killing. Um, can you, um, as someone who, who I'm sure knows the Quran a lot better than I do, um, give me some examples of where the Quran teaches us to love one another and to love our enemies? Obviously, uh, I'm not really teaching sort of Muslims to be compassionate Muslims. Islam teaches them to be compassionate Muslims. So. Uh, that's just that's an integral part of the faith, in fact. And uh, the Quran Karim, if you notice, um, came into uh, came over the period of 23 years. Was revealed over the period of 23 years, and was revealed based on events that were taking place. And as you know very well, and everyone knows, the truth is sometimes unpopular. Uh, just like what happened to Isa, Jesus, alayhi salam the path of sorrow and all this when he spoke the truth and Musa, Moses before him and Noah and all this. So there was always sacrifice and there was always violence involved. Now, Islam does not really tell, teach us anywhere to transgress. In fact, Islam tells you specifically not to transgress, knowing that the environment, once you speak the truth, is going to be extremely violent against you. And Quran came to say, be careful from transgressing. لا تعتدوا إن الله لا يحب المعتدين. Do not transgress, for Allah does not love those who do. All right. So, Al Quran goes to affirm in another another verse also that you do have the right to seek equal justice, an eye for an eye. But then Al Quran goes to say وأن تعفو وتصفحو. If you actually forgive and forget, that's better for you. خير. That's much better for you. So the Quran tries to actually, in fact, number one, puts a limit on that you cannot be reactionaries. You're going to be faced with, with violence, but you cannot be violent. Violence is a language of the inarticulate. Then goes to say, you can never transgress. And then goes to say, to, if you are transgressed upon, you have the right to seek equal justice. That right is there for you. but. If you forgive and forget, then that is much better for you. And then goes to tell us, for example, another in a fourth verse, Hal Jazaul Ihsani illa al Ihsan. Isn't it a reward or is it isn't it natural that when the Creator does good to you that you also do good unto others? So all these actually verses, and there are so many others, are explicit and not only the general concept of love, but a practical application onto how actually to deal with that specific situation. And as far as the verses that came to, I don't see any verses that call for any, I don't know of any verses, and I have memorized the Quran since I was maybe 10 or 11, that, that say that call for any killing or indiscriminate killing or indiscriminate violence whatsoever. And, and, and obviously anyone who wants to, uh, you can easily go to the Old Testament, for example, in Psalms and others and others, and take many, many verses or many things out of context to indicate violent and gruesome scenes. And I don't want to go into comparison, but I think that um, I, I personally do not view any violence there. I view actually restriction of a reaction to violence that is eminent, that will happen to you. And I see actually a framework where the Quran puts how you deal with the, with people, with anyone, whether they like you or they don't like you. And the verses are, in that are numerous, in fact, beyond enumeration at this point. 
And when you go to the Prophet ﷺ's traditions, our Prophet's traditions, you'll see as a continuation, because we do believe as well that the Prophet ﷺ's authentic traditions are also wahi, which means they're also part of revelation. And you will see how he articulates all these things even furthermore, such as when he when he said, Awalaysat nafsan, isn't it that the soul? When he said that he, that anyone who harms any non-Muslim is innocent, is dissolved from dhimma of Allah and his prophet, from 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 being close to Allah and his prophet. So these things are, are right there. Yeah. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Yes. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Um, you, you said, you mentioned about loving yourself before you can love others. Um, uh, on the surface, that sounds... Um, would you maybe elaborate on what you mean loving yourself? Obviously, it's not, not the kind of love which is wearing sunglasses and walking around acting more arrogant. Is it that makes you happy. No. Let <laughs> that float your boat. All right. Loving yourself, obviously, when you truly love yourself, you're loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the first place, obviously. And you're loving the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that is a love of, because number one, you're knowing that that's what's actually good for you. That's your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That will tell you, number one, don't excessively eat. Don't just try to get money, but get money the right way. That's loving yourself. That's what the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells you. Now, loving yourself may tell you, I need more money, more money, more money. Uh, no, it doesn't matter. Don't tell me how I get the money. I just want to get money. Like when you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you realize that you cannot just get money. You cannot get money by stealing, by stealing money. You get money in the right way of getting money. That's loving yourself. All right? So that's the kind of sort of the, the meaning I was uh, alluding to. Wafiq barakat. Yes. Yes, sir. Um, I would like to ask a question, you know, um, basically you have sometimes, you know, you when you speak about unity, unity comes, starts from the level of family first, yeah? So, if you have a family basically where there is a division, obviously when a division occurs, uh, it occurs because both sides, there are mistakes from both sides. But maybe one side wanted to change and they wanted to get back. But if the other side is not willing to get back, what can you do in such a situation? You tell me. What are you going to do about it? Okay. What are you going to do about it? I mean, you try. You never stop trying. You don't talk about it. You try. You keep trying and trying and trying. You put your heart and soul in trying. Before that, you keep praying for that. So you have two aspects. You pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you ask Him to help, and you do something yourself. Do, Allah will see what you're doing. So, there, like I said, there's no ideal situation. But we have to work. Working means that you establish that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and ask Him, genuinely ask Him. Beg him genuinely to help you in that matter, and then you go do what you can. And you can do so much, and you keep doing. Never give hope. Never give up hope. Never. Never say never. You never know. And so you do what you can, and the result is on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any other questions? Thanks for the sisters. If we love others and we seek unity with others, but they don't see unity with us, if we reach out to them and what we get back is damaging to us, what should we do? Obviously, 
uh, human nature is sometimes not that simple. And, and, and re realistically speaking, these things happen. Like I said, human beings, amongst us and amongst every human being, amongst, just we're part of that human fabric. There's a good, the bad, and the ugly in everyone. Our job is to, number one, have that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on daily basis, through our salah. So that our salah, number one, is not ritual, it's spiritual. We're with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Asking Him to help us. I'll give you examples. Look at the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look at the Hadith al-Ta'if. Al-Ta'if. He goes to al-Ta'if to bring peace to these people. To teach them something. Stop killing each other. Stop uh, uh, abusing each other. Stop enslaving each other. Stop doing this, stop doing that. What do they do? They line up two lines for him in, front, in his way. And they throw him with stones. And they unleash their thugs on him. Right? What did he do? You know the du'a, the du'a is hasan. Well, hadith, the hadith Tabarani rawah, who is not a mursad, but I can be what who thiqat, inshallah, who hasan di ghayri. It has a couple of sanans, and so it's uncomfortable to say it's hasan, where he says, Allahumma ilayka ashku dha'fa quwati, wa qilla tahilati wa hawani ala nas. Ya Allah, I, I complain to you, I complain to no one. My weakness. Lakin when Jibreel and the other the other angel, the other narration came and said, let's just, just kill, if you want to destroy everything on them, he intercepts that. That may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring from them man yuwahidullah. So, he was sent, and the hadith of the Imam Muslim, inama bu'ithu rahma, I was sent rahma, not naqma, I was sent as a compassion, not retaliation. I was sent to give people ease and, and comfort, not pain. All right, so since he defines his message of Allah alayhi wa sallam like this, what we do is we do the best. Now, if there's a harm that's going to come, you try to reduce that harm as much as you can. I'm not telling you take the harm, take the pain entirely. But I'm saying there is sacrifice involved. All right? Try to reduce the negative harm that's coming and keep your connection to the Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, irrespective of what people do. Because you sort of take, take your solace, take your, take your comfort from your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what, and what is this, what, that you're serving what He wants you to do. Rather, the perception of people and what they do. Obviously, if there is harm, you don't have to take abuse from people. Don't take abuse from people. But still, pray for them. Still offer them your love and compassion. No one has to take abuse from anybody. Any other questions, comments, concerns, criticism? No more questions. Oh, one more. Should you speak the last one? Yeah. Yes, no, no. Um, Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. All the religions talk about love. Is there anything special in Islam which is different from all the other religions? Uh, is there an essence to take off, especially from Islam? The faith that you have that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam came with and told you gives you a practical step to everything that is transmitted back to him in an authentic way, logically proven. You know that when this hadith is sahih, there is this transition, transmission that was taking you all the way back to him, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi. As Sunnah Nabawi of Sharifa being in, came after the Quran yani, or with the Quran, yani, Quran came there with the tradition of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as he said, Utitu Quran wa mithlahu ma'ah. So that Quran that he, that he came with and something else with it like it, which is the Sunnah, it gives you very detailed explanation of how things are. And you will see so many things 
you will see the hadith that Al-Bukhari narrated. Now, you know, again, we, the, 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 the authentic narrations are numerous. But the hadith that Bukhari narrated gives you an idea of that love and, and compassion. The man that was walking in the desert and was almost dying of thirst, and finally he found a well of water deep down. So he went. He took his shoes off, and he went deep in the well, Hadith al-Bukhari, and he went there and he drank, almost, had almost death, almost was dying. And then he came, climbed back up. When he climbed back up and started walking, he saw a dog that was very, very thirsty. That he was almost trying, he was trying to lick with his tongue the sand, trying to find something. This man, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, tells us, he thought to himself that this dog was just going, is experiencing what I just experienced before. So he went back to the well. He went down to the well. He put some water in his shoe, and he held his shoe, and he climbed back up. And he gave that dog, that thirsty dog, a drink. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informs us that Allah granted this man paradise because he gave that dog a drink. So I just want to take a minute to introduce Medina Institute and what it has to offer, inshallah. Medina Institute is uh, an in initiative which has been launched uh, through the um, direct involvement and direction of the Noble Sheikh. And it will be launching in about two to three weeks. And we will be trying to bring one day and weekend seminars to campuses around the country, inshallah. Uh, and Sheikh will be amongst the instructors for those courses and seminars amongst other scholars, uh, and we, we are trying to bring uh, courses which are highly academic, spiritually nourishing, and beneficial uh, and practical in our lives. Uh, so what we are asking people today, uh, inshallah, is uh, one of the brothers will pass a sheet or two around, if you could just give us your email addresses, and then once the project is launched in a couple of weeks, we will contact you and notify you as to what is on offer, so people can uh, take advantage of that, inshallah. And, uh, and finally, I would just like to thank Sully Isaac for their efforts in organizing this event, Jazakumullah, and for your time.